People have often asked me why I study so many different things. In fact, science can be destroyed by having the disciplines too thin because there's no integration. I'm not quite sure if it's reflective of my early history where I moved from place to place, but I've had a multiple interest. That is, my passion has been discovery and to pursue the unknown, and the unknown is everywhere. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Persinger. I'm a professor of neuroscience at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. I'm associated with the departments of psychology and biology, and uh, I'm very pleased to be a part of the biomolecular science program. I was born in an obscure peninsula called Florida, I think. I wasn't there for very long. I spent most of my youth moving from naval base to naval base uh, along the East Coast and in the central part of the USA. And I uh, completed my uh, PhD at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg in 1971, working primarily with radiation physiology, since that was the great fear of the time. What would happen if we had a global nuclear war? What would be the consequences? I've been at Laurentian University since 1971, so that's, what, 35 years. My daily schedule is I usually get up around uh, 1100, 11 o'clock. For breakfast, I usually have um, always the same, life cereal, chocolate chips, honey, milk, put it in the microwave, get it warm, throw some ice cream on it, warm it again. That keeps me going for the day. Usually skip lunch. If I'm not working on an article, technical article, uh, I come to university, check the email. Uh, if I'm not teaching, then I'm engaging in research of some kind. Then I go home to eat, work out, usually martial arts. I use martial arts for exercise, uh, the, um, uh, the Shaolin Tzu technique, northern China. And then uh, afterwards I come back about 10.30, 11 o'clock, and I stay to about 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, and then I go to sleep. And that's what I do seven days a week, so it's a pretty boring life. In the 1970s and 80s, Laurentian was really uh, a fertile ground for integration between the sciences. The students were the mavericks, and many of them still are. In fact, the mavericks often end up in behavioral neuroscience. They're the ones that are the creative ones. They don't necessarily have A grades, but they're creative, they're imaginative, and they just enjoy challenging authority, and that's what science is all about. Indeed, I have a uh, passion. Hmm, what an interesting comment. Is that contradictory? I don't think so. You can have a strong motivation that's objective. I know that seems to be almost antithetical, but you can. And the scientific method is the most powerful tool the human brain has ever devised to pursue the unknown. Now, I'm talking about the scientific method, not scientists. Most scientists follow social behavior. Sadly, they make decisions based upon what they think the consensus might be. They don't challenge the unknown. Do you realize that in Canada, if you study the paranormal, if you study magnetic fields, if you study any kind of, for example, racial differences or intelligence differences, things that could fundamentally help us all, you are actually marginalized by today's science councils. And so I think the critical feature is that the scientific method is the tool by which we can cut through the nonsense of political correctness and social consensus, which is almost always based upon the loudest mouth, not the biggest brain. All experience is derived from brain activity. Your ability to love, your ability to even think that you're having a memory. It all comes from brain activity. The brain may be complicated, but it's not impossible to study. That's the great mythology, that it's beyond our understanding. No, it's not. The critical feature about our research indicates, in fact, it indicates a scientific basis to mystical experiences. In the past, people have assumed that mystical experiences were somehow a part of this mind-body dualism. You can't study them, or you shouldn't study them, which is not very scientific, is it? But this says there's a science to why people have religious experiences and mystical experiences. And we can study them. It doesn't make them wrong. It doesn't refute them. It says we can study them from the point of view of brain function. And we can understand a great deal about what stimuli produce them and the kind of people that have them. People fight and die to maintain their culture and their language. So what we ask was, suppose you stimulate the right hemisphere. What would happen? Would you have another sense of self? So when we did that experimentally, we found that most people reported a sensed presence, a feeling that some sentient being was standing nearby. And we realized, this is only 25 years ago, we realized that perhaps this is the prototype to every human brain on this planet of the God experience.
Well, this is the uh, Corin helmet after Stan Corin, who built it. It was based upon a design where we figured that the most effective way to influence uh, the brain is very weak magnetic fields that uh, work at the level of consciousness, the electromagnetic fields associated with consciousness, which are very, very weak. And uh, so consequently, these different solenoids generate little teeny magnetic fields that are then generated between the temporal lobes, all right? And the pattern that's generated across will, uh, after about 15 minutes, in the dark with the eyes closed, produce experiences that are very similar to many, many mystical experiences. You don't need big, massive, intense fields. That's an interesting mentality, the idea of the bigger the better. Nah, normally physiology doesn't work that way. So that's uh, procedure, and of course this cannot be done without computers. The singling, the information being sent through the solenoids, uh, is thanks to the fact that computers have infinite possibilities of patterns. And in those patterns is information. And information does not have to be loud. It doesn't have to be ostentatious. It just has to be essential. Poets, writers, creative people, artists are remarkably sensitive to these magnetic fields and remarkably sensitive to mystical experiences. The same kind of experience that's associated with certain kinds of pharmacological agents, certain drugs, but there's no drugs here. This is simply the brain talking to itself. Think of it this way. If the brain is generating these experiences, and don't get into the philosophical argument that God created them and they have to be real or does God exist because it's really an irrelevant argument in this particular context. The critical thing is if people will kill others because they think their mystical experience or God experience was true, shouldn't we know the brain mechanisms responsible for that? This is what we do all lab down. <laughs> I'll tell you a secret. I never work. All this stuff is really enjoyable. I find nothing more exciting than lecturing and teaching and interacting. Uh, I enjoy writing and thinking and pushing the envelope. So basically, I never work. It's always quite enjoyable. Today's topic is going to be psychotropic drugs, a handful of them. And specifically, we want to investigate the nature of consciousness and what consciousness is and how it can be modified by drugs. Now, specifically those which have political and economic impact. Now, this is a very warm room. And if you want to remove all of your clothes in order to get into a situation that's receptacle or appropriate for this particular altered state, please feel free to do so. Now, first of all, what is a psychotropic drug? Basically, it's any compound, any chemical that imitates a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter is the chemistry by which neurons interact. And the reason psychotropic drugs work is because they imitate the functions of those transmitters, but they go beyond that such that they stimulate certain areas more than normal. For example, marijuana, THC. Where in the brain does it localize? It localizes within the frontal region. So one of the reasons you get the anxiolytic effects, that is the effects of uh, reducing anxiety, is because you're stimulating the frontal lobe. But also it influences the hippocampus. So, as a result, short-term memory is affected. Of course, you know how that works. Next time somebody is high as a kite on marijuana, and they're talking prolifically with that elegant and fantastic language they use, stop them, distract them, and then ask them about 10 seconds later, what were you just saying? and they probably won't be able to tell you, certainly not after 20 seconds. Marijuana also, if you have too much ingestion, will influence other areas, the parietal regions, for example. As a result, touch feels sensual, and consequently, uh, very often, music may seem profound. And there's still an unresolved issue. If indeed you play that record back, do you really hear Paul is dead? Now, that's for the older people in the group who never heard of the Beatles, all right? If you have heard of them, you know what I mean. Now, other kinds of drugs, specifically such as um, STP, or DOME, which is a dimethyl methamphetamine, because it localizes within the amygdala, is often associated with aggression. So where the drug is, okay, and where it localizes within the brain will influence its impact on the person's experience. So I think the critical question is to ask what the structure of the drug is in terms of its similarity to neurotransmitters, 
where in the brain it localizes, that is where it concentrates. And the third feature is effectively what are the dosages. Now, in terms of uh, psychotropic drugs, I think it's important to realize that if we look at this great rabble knot, which is the human brain, and here we have a nice shot of it, we can see there's the frontal lobe, and of course if you influence the frontal lobe just a bit, you can get creativity. One of the, people, one of the reasons that people report creativity with marijuana is that this mild anxiolytic effect produces this kind of free association. But remember, all drugs influence maximally at small dosages, these kinds of drugs, and too much of a dosage can actually be uh, an opposite effect or produce an opposite effect. The temporal lobe is also involved. Uh, we look at the temporal lobe here. The temporal lobe is actually the locus for LSD effects. Most people don't know that. But if you remove the temporal lobe, there are no LSD effects. That in many respects, LSD experiences and most of the serotonin-based uh, psychedelics work by producing a dreamlike state and involving the temporal lobe. And the experiments have been shown that if you remove the temporal lobe, LSD just doesn't produce the experiences that occur in the normal person. So we have to know something about this great rabble knot, and I think the first thing we must know is that if we take a look at that brain, there it is, the white matter, sending information in and out of the gray area, which is the cortices, that for all practical purposes, consciousness is a closed loop. We have all this information going up into the cortex, but really, if we think at it quantitatively, only about 20% of the input to our, cor our cortex is sensory. All the rest of it is talk or interactions between those neurons, which means that consciousness is a closed loop, and sensory input is just a minor, minor modification. Consciousness is actually created by this loop that is activated once every approximately 20 milliseconds with a phase modulation of about 12 milliseconds. That means if we change the neural chemistry within the cortices, we change the way you experience the world, we change your consciousness. So let's begin then with uh, some of these classic ones in terms of understanding <clears throat> the kinds of images. Let's take a look at the consistent images associated with, uh, here we go, mescaline, for example. Now, mescaline is actually a trimethoxy uh, ethyl amide, which means it's basically a compound very similar to dopamine. Remember what dopamine is. That's the one involved with all kinds of addictions. And there's a range of addictive capacities. Uh, marijuana is not very addictive, LSD a bit more, and still some other drugs like opiates quite addictive, but only about 20% become addicted. So the point is that all of these various kinds of psychotropics, when you take them, go through various kinds of stages. Mescaline, so-called peyote, in stage one, the typical experience is a grating or a lattice, cobweb shapes, a tunnel or a funnel or a cone, and a spiral. Of course, many conditions can produce this. Psychotropics can do it. In stage two, in stage two, we have meaningful images, very meaningful images emerge. And these meaningful images can be very idiosyncratic. Then you have peoples, animals, and places. 60% to 70% of all people or all subjects report small animals or human figures that are friendly or caricature-like. Now, in some cultures, it may be called the totem, the spirit guide, the protectorate. And of course, 70%, 72% report religious imagery. And that doesn't change that much with most of your famous psychotropic compounds. Now, I'm going to mention later that you don't have to have a chemical do this. The appropriately patterned magnetic field applied to the brain can also do this as well. In other words, you do not have to have a drug. Anything that changes brain activity, including these patterned fields we've been developing, can produce similar experiences. Well, let me give you some actual drawings. This is a drawing of a woman who was having a near-death experience. Now, very often, near-death experiences are coupled with these psychotropic effects because hypoxia, alterations in cortical activity, can actually produce something very similar. Here's a woman who was having a near-death experience. She suddenly felt all of these little things around her coming out of an iconic, in this case, it was uh, Mary and Child. This is a Japanese woman. 
Because remember, the human brain is remarkably similar across all six billion of us. We exaggerate the differences, but neurochemically, we're almost identical. So consequently, all of us will be prone to these kinds of experiences. We will go through the same stages because we are a singular species. We just exaggerate the differences. The actual picture looks like this. This is what she drew, which she would saw these little entities. But then she saw this. And then, of course, classic. You've seen this in most all cultures. A kind of window opens. It's sort of like the light at the other end. And, of course, you've all heard the very idea of the light at the end of the tunnel. Then she perceived this particular shape full of multiple colors. Then, of course, because of the nature of the uh, activity, she felt herself moving through this, through this uh, funnel or tunnel. She felt the moving sensations. Because notice the faces are emerging. And, and the, of course, luckily, she was an artist who could report this. And as she got closer to the bottom, of course, she began to have this feeling of reaching infinity. Notice these are all faces. Of course, all cultures talk about this. If you look at the Egyptian Book of the Dead or the Tibetan Book of the Dead or any of these other representations of what it's like to be in an altered state, you will find that very similar patterns emerge. Remember, six billion brains were basically the same, well, were the copies, six billion copies of the same DNA, really. Now, one of the typical ways by which this is done is some of the drugs, for example, that involve serotonin. And some of the classic ones involved with serotonin include psilocybin. And it produces very specific kinds of patterns that you see the Aztecs used to uh, imitate on their various designs, these intricate designs. And, of course, lysergic acid amide, morning glory seeds. Uh, morning glory seeds... Uh, and, of course, LSD is one of the derivatives of that. Actually, it came from ergot. The one we're talking about as well is harmine, uh, which is the Banisteriopsis in the Western Aranaco Basin. That one was called telepathine at one time because under its influence, people thought they could read minds. In fact, both the Soviets and the Americans sent in expedition forces in the 1960s to get this famous stuff, to extract it, to use it for remote viewing. And, of course, bufotenine, one of the types of uh, uh, psychotropics from toad skins. Um, you probably remember Bubble, Bubble, Toil and Trouble, The Three Witches of Macbeth, the whole idea of witchery, the idea of using toad skin. Well, there is a clear hallucinogen contained within the toads. And if you ever watch Beavis and Butthead, you're too, too young for Beavis and Butthead? Remember the episode of them sucking on the toads? I think they have the wrong idea of how to get bufotenine. But you see, this kind of class of compounds can produce marked altered states. Now, is there an optimal hallucinogen? Is there an optimal psychotropic? And the answer is no. Because for any of these compounds to work, their basic chemistry must imitate something you already have in your brain. That's right. Some of you are probably making this right now in small amounts. In fact, even something like marijuana would not be effective unless you had the receptors already in your brain. They're called cannabinoids in the case of marijuana. And of course, uh, and you probably have guessed that there are substances you can eat that can stimulate the cannabinoid receptors, dark chocolate, but it would take quite a bit. And you would probably have adverse side effects. I think it's weight gain. <laughs> All, right. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a look at Strassman's work on ayahuasca, he calls it the spiritual molecule. And indeed, this particular molecule, which is dimethyltryptamine, right, dimethyltryptamine, uh, started in the Orinoco Basin. And it's interesting, when people have these experiences, it's all a function of your culture. The local natives say it's the mother, uh, the jungle mother appearing to them. <clears throat> the Catholics say Mother Mary is appearing to them. And the Protestants say something else, that was Christ appeared to them. So the basic chemistry that's stimulating the brain is the same, but the explanations are given by the culture. 
Now notice this interesting effect. It's a Strassman's work called the spirit molecule. Uh, the typical experiences are kaleidoscopic display of visual hallucinations, separation of consciousness from the physical body, very much like the diagram sequence I showed you with that near-death experience, <clears throat> feelings of another, the feeling of a presence. Almost always there's a feeling of a presence. And cultures can identify it as a, a spirit guide or a, a dead person or an iconic individual, such as a local religious feature, figure. They're all basically the feeling of another. <coughs> now, some people have the capacity to make DMT within the pineal organ because melatonin is effectively that compound, effectively N-acetyl-5-methoxytryptamine. So some of you can be naturally high. I've been accused of that. I've been accused of being naturally high because, well, actually it's not just unique to me, most creative people, the musicians, the writers, the poets, the sculptors, all of those individuals often have a altered brain chemistry that gives them insight into other relationships and to other patterns. So some people may take drugs and have it. Other people do it spontaneously. And some people may be due to an actual modification of their experience. Did you realize that Luther, Martin Luther, who started Lutheranism, was a basically low-rate, second-rate monk until he was struck by lightning. The changes in his temporal lobe organization and the chemistry that he obviously experienced subsequent to that resulted in a massive change of human history. So the point is, that these particular compounds can be made in the brain. It's just that drugs enhance what's already there. Themes of experiences, other planets, contacts with aliens, other dimensions, white spaces, places and people from the past, cartoon-like people. The same kind of sequence I mentioned for mescaline shows up in the ayahuasca sequence as well. Now I had the uh, privilege of evaluating and chatting with a scientist, a BBC science director. As you know, very often we have visits from film crews and so forth on the campus that come to be stimulated by the helmet. And the helmet produces effects which are very, very similar because we imitate what the drugs do, what the compounds do, without any side effects. In this case, he reported what he'd experienced down when he took El Yega, which is the local name for ayahuasca, <clears throat> and he said, if I kept my eyes open, I would see people in the room. When I closed my eyes, I saw people and images floating as well as forces and colors emerging from people's heads. I experienced a male voice that said it was instructing me. It referred to we, the voice oriented along the right side of my body. Okay, ready? If the voice is located on the right side of the body, which part of the brain is being stimulated? Left, left side, left temporal lobe, exactly. It gives you the left temporal lobe being stimulated. There was an intense feeling of a presence. I attributed it to God. The Roman Catholics who were present, most of them Spanish descendants, attributed it to the Virgin Mary. The local tribal natives attributed it to the presence of the jungle mother. So remember, the experience, the basic pattern of firing is similar, except that the name and the attribution, the explanation, is a function of uh, the culture. Now, he says, images were along my right visual field, Geometric forms with deep emotion were more perceptible along my left visual field. So perceptual along my left visual field means what? Right hemispheric. And usually geometric forms would show up over the left side, left visual field, because it's right hemisphere, spatial patterns associated with the right hemisphere, and more uh, language being attributed to the right side. He heard a voice, we are your genes. The crystals that prevented access to knowledge have melted away, and now you have access to knowledge. The voices said they would give me a gift. The gift was total recall. Now, I don't know if that was before or after the Schwarzenegger movie, <laughs> but the point is, very often your own experiences and your cultural experiences are incorporated into the phenomenon. When I asked the genes uh, why, did people, uh, why people did not die after they had children, because after all, one of our primary purposes is to maintain this DNA sequence, the voices said, we too are electronic systems that have a life of our own. And seven, a few days of nightly consumption of El Yega, I could sit near somebody and just know all of the facts about the person. I felt I was reading other people's thoughts and hearing knowing events. So in other words, this is a classic kind of altered state. And you can see why it's a powerfully 
personal kind of experience and why it has political impact and economic impact. Can you imagine a drug that allows you to experience, if it's true, to experience what other people are thinking? No more secrets. No more hiding. Basically, there's nothing that can be kept from anyone else. Not that it would become the Borg, all right, of Star Trek fame. But the point is, if this was true, you can imagine this would change the way our societies would interact forever. All right. And you can see why they would be a threat to some. Now, other kinds of... Uh, did, you, did, you ever, did you ever see what happened to the actual person who... Uh, uh, Hoffman, who brought about LSD, discovered LSD in 1943. Hoffman was trying to find a cure for migraine headaches using ergot. Ergot, of course, is the compound made from the fungus of rye, one of the reasons that there were big epidemics of seeing werewolves and all kinds of things during the Middle Ages. People would have contaminated rye bread and hallucinate in mass. But uh, did you ever see his actual statement when he actually got it on his fingers? Well, here's what he said. Last Friday, in the midst of my afternoon work in the laboratory, I had to give up working. I had to go home because I experienced a very peculiar attack of dizziness. At home, I went to bed and got into a not unpleasant state of drunkenness, which was characterized by an extreme stimulating fantasy. When I closed my eyes, the daylight was almost most unpleasant to me. I experienced fantastic images of an extraordinary plasticity. They were associated with an intense kaleidoscope play of colors. After about two hours, in this condition had disappeared. He just got it on his fingers. Can you imagine what would happen if you had a compound you could breathe like that? Incidentally, the idea of manipulating and influencing populations by something in the water supply is not unusual. Do you realize that the WHO, the World Health Organization, actually thought about and had a motion to put Valium all right, into the water supply of Lebanon? during one of the first Lebanon crises in order to minimize aggression. Incidentally, you know about hemp and hashish, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. I've actually had letters from people, let's say, in the Middle East who argue, is there any electromagnetic pattern that you can give me that if someone is taking hashish would incapacitate them? The idea that drugs have political impact as well as personal impact is really one of the greatest challenges, not only to brain and behavior, but to civilizations. Well, what about this one? Marijuana or cannabis. The active ingredient is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and the typical concentration in a marijuana cigarette, about 1 to 4 percent THC. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a question about what you said about uh, Eliega. Is there any Anything to indicate that there are drugs out there that would allow us the ability to read other people's thoughts? Well, there are lots of drugs that the question is, are there lots of drugs out there that can allow us to read people's thoughts? The first thing you'd have to do is to differentiate, is it just a subjective experience? Because if you stimulate the amygdala and certain other areas at the same time you have any experience, you'll think it's true. I mean, during the time of stimulations of the temporal lobe, if you stimulate the temporal lobe, people can be listening to a foreign language and think they understand it. All right, because you have to realize the brain is being modified by these drugs. So you'd have to have an external kind of uh, modification as well, or an external kind of verification. Um, the sensibility seed, 6%. Hashish. You've heard of hashish before, haven't you? Okay. The resin of cannabis flowers, 8 to 14%. Hashish, where have you seen that before? Hashish, of course, comes from the word, the Arabic word meaning assassin. That's right. During the 11th to 13th century, there were a whole group in the Middle East called assassins. They stopped Genghis Khan cold, as well as the Mongols. And of course, by consuming this material, they felt totally immortal, totally super in terms of power and capacity. And you can imagine what it's like if you have someone in your midst who can simply go up and kill you and don't really care. Yeah, basically hashish comes from uh, the word assassin, which means basically hashish eater. Now, that is, that's just a way that drugs can be used by political forces. But remember, all you're really doing in either case is modifying what's already in the brain in terms of what is possible. 
Hashish oil from boiling hashish, hashish crystals. These are various forms. Now, now in terms of the effects of THC, most people know, and in fact there's a lot of people who consume it, it's estimated up to 40% of the population your age may have had at least one marijuana cigarette. At least one as a people laugh and chuckle under the, and saying, that's a conservative estimate. <laughs> and remember, you can predict the effects by knowing what parts of the brain are being stimulated. So for example, for example, in the small or earlier stages, it's the frontal phenomena, so you get that kind of inebriation effect, which is somewhat similar but not identical to that from ethanol in small dosages. Then you get the synesthesia effect, where you get the effects of uh, feeling music. Uh, sometimes there's a red glow around uh, various kinds of objects. The meaningfulness of visual stimulations increase. People become more sensual. And also, because at higher dosages or after more than 15 minutes the hypothalamus gets stimulated, something occurs called the marijuana munchies. You ever the marijuana munchies? Right. If you give people a bunch of small marshmallows, somehow they get almost hyperphagic in nature in terms of consuming various kinds of uh, marshmallows. Um, and I always find it too very interesting is that, that uh, when you have individuals who are like this, they feel like they have, they're very uh, elegant and eloquent when they speak, but objectively, it's a phenomenon that's going on inside the brain. And of course, there's time distortion. Time often feels like it stops. Now, people have asked me, what is the comparable effects of an ethanol drunk and a marijuana high? Very, very clearly. Compared to the average ethanol drunk, the marijuana high is marginal in terms of performance impairment, which is an interesting problem, isn't it? The typical ethanol drunk is really performance impairing. A comparable marijuana high, if it's impairing at all, is minimal in comparison. That data has been available in the literature for I don't know how long, but people do not want to take a look objectively at the data. Now, what are some of the medical uses of THC? Well, treating glaucoma for reduction of intraocular pressure, asthma produces bronchial dilation. And remember, tetrahydrocannabinol works because you already have cannabinoid receptors in your brain. Some people actually seem to make this compound themselves. All right. In fact, some individuals actually get better when they smoke marijuana or take THC because normally they're fuzzy, but when they consume it, and these are usually heavy guys uh, with a lot of corticosteroids, a lot of cortisol, uh, when they take this compound, they actually are more focused I think one of the interesting features is that you have to know the pattern of the brain activity. Did you realize that one of the greatest causes of mental retardation is ethanol consumption during pregnancy? It produces the fetal alcoholic syndrome or the fetal alcoholic disorder. The area of the brain that is impaired, which is frontal, right orbital frontal in particular, in fetal alcoholic syndrome which means they have more difficulty, these individuals have more uh, difficulty interacting with their peers, following social rules and so forth, as one of the reasons they're involved with the criminal system so often. That the drug that would reverse the effect that is produced in appropriate stimulation in this case would be THC. Now, isn't that an interesting contradiction? In order to reverse something from one drug, another drug is required. That is also well known in the literature. Okay, you can also use THC for treating nausea. And again, THC is an anti-emitic from chemotherapy. And it can be used to treat some types of epileptic seizures. Some types of epileptic seizures. And of course, the purity is critical. And there are many kinds of complex partial seizures that are ap or appropriately treated by THC. The advantage, of course, the side effects are minimal. Now, again, this is not to say that psychotropics should be abused. They are like any other tool. They're only as proficient and as dangerous as the person using it, and as knowledgeable as the person using it. Well, in terms of uh, specific features of marijuana in the 1980s, 70 percent of adults between ages of 27 and 32 had used THC. Tolerance develops with chronic high quantum exposure. Of course, as I mentioned before, the effects are short-term but not long-term memory deficits. Increased uh, cerebral blood flow in the right hemisphere. 
And of course, if you have increased cerebral blood flow in the right hemisphere, which is typical of most of your psychotropics, that's why you get the visual spatial effect. That's why you get the sense of the presence, because the sensed presence is really the right hemispheric equivalent of your sense of self. And when it intrudes into awareness, you feel this other sentient being. Um, you also get attenuates the luteinizing hormone in men and women. And uh, of course, with excessive use, you can also get gynecomastia. What's gynecomastia? Gynaco? Gynaco? You can answer, you know. Gynaco being? What? Man boobs? Uh, man boobs? <laughs> At least you didn't say bitch tits. <laughs> yes, you can get very clearly, all right, ma female breast on a male. What about the amotivational syndrome? Well, the amotivational syndrome is basically with chronic usage, and it doesn't work for all. The critical thing about drugs and psychopharmacology in general is that not everybody responds negatively or in the same way. You realize even with opiates, that is with heroin, that addiction only shows up in 20% of the cases. So the issue of the adverse effects of any compound from aspirin to attending classes is going to be a function of the person's individual ma brain, uh, brain makeup and brain patterns. It's a mark analgesic. In fact, you realize that Siggy, yeah, good old Freud, used to use, and his friends in Vienna used to use uh, hemp to treat menstrual cramps. It wasn't very reliable because in those days they didn't realize that the active ingredient was the tetrahydrocannabinol. The chemistry wasn't there yet. Now, what about some of the other well-known ones? Uh, some of the interesting drugs which uh, have come out in the past. One of them is reserpine, a rawolfia, all right, rawolfia type of compound, rawolfia. And it was certainly available in the ancient Indus Valley. It was certainly uh, available to the Essenes. And uh, one of the things we find about reserpine, take a good look at it, is it's classic of drugs. Remember I said there's individual differences? A synergism means that when you put compounds together, they produce something different. And we found here that if an animal shows temporal lobal ability, is restrained, and is given reserpine, the animal will show death-like features for a couple of days in hypothermia, and then literally rise from the dead. Now, let's take a good look at that. One of the hypotheses we've come up with over the years in several cultures, sensitives, shaman, religious leaders, who are very likely to have been limbic epileptics, very often, and that's not a pejorative term. Limbic lability is tied to creativity. It's tied to insight. It's tied to extracting information from the environment that the contemporaries don't have. And it's right hemispheric. Something to do with the right hemisphere and creativity. When they are restrained, tied, crucified, or whatever, and then given a bitter-tasting concoction that was followed by a death-like hypothermia for about three days. If the person recovered, the phenomenon was considered rising from the dead. Incidentally, this was a practice among the Celts. They were called the Druids. Rising from the dead, a proof of transcendence of death. Contemporary research indicates that these individuals would have sustained a specific type of brain damage that it would result in an amnesia of people and places with whom the person was familiar, as well as a marked change in personality. And I should point out that the Essenes, that's right, ancient Palestine, rough about 2,000 years ago, very interesting character at the time, walked around, consumed a bitter-tasting material, restrained and crucified. Was it a pharmacological phenomenon? Well, we will never know because we don't have a time machine, but the point is, if you understand synergisms, the greatest mysteries of the universe are no longer mysteries. The scientific method is the most powerful tool we have to understanding what's really the truth. Now, finally, let's take a good look at opium, since a great deal of today's politics is tied to opium. Opium, of course, uh, you get all kinds of good compounds from opium. Heroin's the most typical. And the breakdown product of heroin is morphine. 
tremendously important drug in medicine. Fantastic analgesic. And if you take a look at the components of opium, morphine, codeine, thebane, heroin was first synthesized in 1898 by Bayer Company. The synthetic uh, from thebane is called fentanyl. And notice that laudanum was the addictive compound of the 19th century. Your great-great-grandparents were probably addicted on one of three or four things. Either laudanum, which was opium with wine and spices, or uh, wormwood oil, the green fairy, or marijuana, or cocaine which incidentally was in Coca-Cola way back when, when it was used to treat headaches. So there's always been this issue about pharmacological compounds. And uh, laudanum was used, in fact, one of the interesting things about it, to show you the social relationship between drugs and brain function, is that if you were a 19, late 19th century British middle class or upper class, you had laudanum frequently as a small toddy, and that was fine. But if you were Chinese, smoking it through another device, you were considered less than human. In other words, the manner in which you consume a drug often defines its legitimacy. Right? Now, to show you some idea of the importance of opiates, let me give you a short history of opium. Why would you want to talk about history in a brain and behavior course? Because when you talk about modifying brain activity, when you talk about controlling six billion brains, it becomes a political issue. It's not just neuroanatomy anymore. It's not just neurofunction. It's not no, long, no longer neurochemistry. Most people don't realize this, that before the 18th century, opium was employed sparingly by the Chinese. During the 18th century, British required Chinese tea, but there were no goods for exchange. In 1773, the British conquered Bengal province in India and acquired the monopoly over raw opium. Opium was smuggled into China. The population was purposely addicted. The Chinese proclaimed war on Britain. Of course, they lost the war in 1842. You can't fight very much with kung fu against muskets. In exchange, the British obtained Hong Kong for the contract that was just released just a few years ago. It's harbor and open trade with China. And in the Treaty of 1860, China was required to legalize opium within its borders. So if you have any compound that can influence masses of human behavior, you can imagine what it does from the point of view of impact. So what do we do about it as neuroscientists? first thing we have to do is to realize that consciousness is created within the brain, that it's related to neurochemical patterns, certain compounds occurring in nature, and optimally still to be synthesized by large drug companies could easily modify the way consciousness operates, making us more and more homogeneous and less and less individual. These are all possibilities because of the potency of these compounds. But we shouldn't end it there. We should also point out that there are many ways to produce altered states. The effectiveness and consequences of chemical interactions with cells are functions of the complexity of the spatial structure of the molecules. We know that. The reason LSD has an effect is because it imitates serotonin. The reason mescaline has an effect because it's similar to dopamine. Right. The reason some of the other more sickening compounds, such as uh, uh, the, uh, some of the uh, crazy weeds that uh, used to be found along the eastern coast of uh, Virginia, when you held it and played with it and pulled, it out, pulled your hands out with it, you felt like you were floating and flying and you were a witch. Uh, these compounds that made you sick as a dog, those were cholinergic compounds because they were similar to acetylcholine. So these wor drugs work because they imitate. Right, Structures. But the critical thing is, we can still do it with something else. There's more and more evidence that small, weak forces can influence 
brain activity and alter consciousness. And we're about ready to go into this environment. It's called the communication age. Right now you're being inundated with all kinds of communication patterns, which if they're pulsed just right, well, I'll show you what they can do. The effectiveness and consequences of electromagnetic interactions with cells are functions of the complexity of the temporal structure of the fields. Remember, the brain works by chemistry, but it also works on the other side of the coin by electromagnetic patterns, right? brain waves. If you apply an appropriate temporal pattern, it's equivalent to the molecular structure of the compound. So, using the famous helmet studies that almost everybody knows, if you stimulate the patterns through the helmet, and here's an example of someone wearing the helmet, the Corin helmet, magnetic fields of various patterns being generated through the temporal lobe, because remember the temporal lobe is ultimately the source to many of these powerful psychedelic experiences. you end up with these kinds of experiences. People will invariably say, I felt the presence of something or somebody. In other words, here's a way of producing the altered state without the side effects of the drugs. There were pleasant vibrations moving through my body. As I felt, I felt as if I left my body or was detached from my body. The experiences did not come from my own mind, they came from somewhere else, that they were intruded, and I felt as if I were somewhere else. The same sequence that's associated with the psychedelic type drugs. And finally, to give you one example before we end, here's an example of a 25 year old male, both temporal lobes being stimulated. It takes about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, just like many drug effects, except you're stimulating, you're tickling the tail of the dragon with any kind of side effects. I felt as if there were a bright white light in front of me. So the person sitting in a chamber, blindfolded, weak magnetic fields, weaker than the ones from your hair dryer, very similar to the ones that you're exposed to when your face is in front of your computer screen, or when you have your Walkman on, or your MP3 player. Same kind of intensity, difference information. The person says, I felt as if there was a bright light in front of me. I saw a black spot that became a kind of funnel, no tunnel, that I felt drawn into. I felt moving, like spinning forward through it. I began to feel the presence of people, but I could not see them. They were along my sides. They were colorless, gray-looking people. I know I was in the chamber, but it was very real. I suddenly felt intense fear and felt ice cold. You can imagine what it would be if the person was sitting perhaps somewhere else, in a less secure setting. So when we talk about psychedelics and psychotropic compounds influencing consciousness, remember one important thing. Again, to reiterate, Structure dictates function, so the reason psychedelic drugs have an effect is because they indicate the brain's own chemistry. All of us have the capacity to make these compounds or they wouldn't be effective. Some of us make more of these compounds than others, and we have different altered states all the time. And the fourth and most important feature is that anyone who can control consciousness, no matter who it may be, individual, political, group, can control consciousness by drugs, either illicit or condoned, control the population because they control the sense of self.